Olwen here uh, to present his talk. Um, Peter was a commanding officer in the British Navy. Um, his talk today is based on his book that was published last year, March last year. Um, as you can see in the title, uh, is, is really recollections of his father's uh, memoirs and diaries and notes. In particular, around the time when his father was a captain as part of the flotilla off to book. So uh, I welcome Peter and, uh, and thank you so much for being here this afternoon. Mm -hmm. And I should say, just an note, his book is for sale this afternoon as well. Thank you, Dennis. I'm going to uh, hopefully speak without a microphone because I find it easier that way. Um, this talk is uh, very much a personal talk about, uh, about my father, or at least about what he wrote and recorded. I had the privilege of inheriting from him some tiny little uh, notebooks and some naval message forms on which he recorded uh, virtually every day of his uh, two years uh, between June 1941 and uh, February 19, or end of January 1943. He was in fact in the Royal Navy for 46 years and so it's only two years of what was a, a remarkable career. Um, he recorded these every day right the way through those two years and I thought, well, apart from the fact that I had to translate them, uh, because A, they were written in pencil, they were very quite faded, but had lots of initials, lots of first names, lots of names which I didn't even know were what they were, and it took me about two years to uh, sort it out. In the book there's a glossary which uh, covers quite an extensive section at the back. But I, did, I think I managed to get about 80, well probably near 90% of what he recorded. Uh, there. The, the really difficult thing was, of course, the people, because most of the, pe most of the names of people were either first names, because they were friends of his, or nicknames, because they were friends of his, or just a surname. And, you know, I had to try and find out what they were. The other reason I feel that, you know, quite important about this book is the fact that it deals with Tobruk. With respect to the uh, army people in the room, the problem with Tobruk, I find, is that the soldiers, quite rightly, get a terrific uh, congratulations on what they did in Tobruk. No doubt deserved, those army people in Tobruk were the first people to actually halt a uh, or at least to frustrate a German advance in World War II. And those same people also finished up in uh, New Guinea where they were the first people to halt a Japanese advance. So a very credible, creditable uh, performance. But what gets forgotten is that they were besieged and they had to survive on what was brought in by sea. And the interesting thing is that uh, you don't get that. I mean, for example, uh, that well-known author, Peter Fitzsimon, hardly mentions the Navy at all in his book about Tobruk, despite the fact that I did, in fact, offer to uh, give him the information that I knew. The other thing, uh, which is a recent thing I've discovered, I've got a friend, Rear Admiral Ian Crawford, who's been endeavouring to get uh, the White Ensign flown at the Rats of Tobruk uh, Memorial in Anzac Parade in down in Canberra. And this has been refused, unfortunately, in the past because of somebody down in Melbourne who says, oh, no, no, this is a Rats of Tobruk. Well, 
my father actually has, or my, uh, they, uh, sorry, I was given a posthum, posthumous medal for my father by the Rats of Tobruk Association. And in their thing, they, they say the Rats of Tobruk Association is for all Army, Navy, and Air Force people who were involved in that. And so Ian Crawford, supported with a letter from me, have written to the people who are in charge of the, war, uh, the memorials there, saying, let us have the white ensign blown there. And one of the reasons I did that is because I was in fact invited to go down to Canberra and take part in a video that the naval uh, people were recording about uh, the Tobruk Ferry Service. And one of the, they sent me a list of questions before um, the video. They said, how many ships were involved in the Tobruk Ferry Service? So I thought, well, I don't actually know that. So I went through these daily notes, my father, all this period between uh, that he wrote them, and uh, uh, came up with 139. So quite a, quite a number of ships involved in that. Sure, there weren't a lot of warships. Then there were a lot of Australian warships, of course, the scrap arm flotilla, but also there were others. And uh, uh, the Parramatta, the Yarra, and I think the Nizam and another N class uh, destroyer. Okay. So there were a lot of Australian ships in there. And of course, there were two of them sunk. Waterhen was one of them, the first Australian ship to be sunk in World War II. And the other was the was the uh, Parramatta. Anyway, let me get on with the talk. There's my dad in his captain's uniform, which is what he was when he was appointed in charge of the Tobruk Ferry Service. Uh, he'd actually been appointed as the captain of a cruiser called the Liverpool. And he'd gone all the way out from England, round South Africa, to, uh, to um, Portside, uh, where he reported to Cunningham and was told, well, I'm sorry, but your ship's had its bows blown off by a torpedo. What happened was that, uh, and I actually served in HMS Liverpool as a midshipman later on, what happened was that uh, a torpedo had struck the bows of the ship, and up in the bows they had a compartment which contained a tank for the uh, fuel for the seaplane that they carried. And the torpedo hitting the bars had actually fractured not only the tank for the petrol, but also the compartment that it was kept in, which was full of water. Of course, petrol seeped out of the tank, went up to the top of the other tank, got out of that, and the fumes went all the way back to a gun turret where a nice electric motor was going and there was a spark and that's what happened to the forecastle and that's what happened to the keel. So there was no, uh, there was no bows on the ship. Cunningham, who actually knew my father because he'd been in charge of him in destroyers in the Mediterranean earlier uh, in, in the 1930s, so I'm not going to waste you sending you off to America to take that ship for its repairs, you can go and look after these ships which are supplying the army uh, up and down the coast of uh, Africa, North Africa. So that's how he came to be there. Uh, when he started, uh, General Wavell was just advancing up the African coast, and uh, so he had three ships, uh, uh, a monitor called the Terror, and a couple of little gunboats, but it gradually grew. Those are the notebooks. <laughs> you might say, why is, there a, why is there a signal form there? Well, I think I know why. Uh, I think I know why. It's because uh, on the 24th of April, uh, his office in Tobruk was bombed. 
And I think he had obviously started a notebook before then, but lost it. So since publishing the letter, I've come, uh, the book, I've come across a letter written to his mother saying, I'm sorry, I can't number this letter because I've lost the previous notebook. I've lost the, my record of it. And because he used to number all the letters that he sent off. I'll show you how he did that later on. So I think there was a notebook which would have been when he started, which was back in March, but that first period was lost until he started writing on those and then started on other notebooks. That's what the notebooks uh, looked like. You can see it in the, those little boxes. In fact, that, that lists who he wrote to on that day. And there's a tick with a number, and that's the fact that he recorded that the letter had been received and the date on which it was received. And that's right the way through. The other thing about this uh, particular entry is it's Wednesday, uh, it's Tuesday the 9th of December 1941, and Wednesday the 10th of December 1941. And I don't know whether you can read, the bottom line on the right hand page reads, Prince of Wales and Repulse Sunk. I think that means something to somebody in this room. And there's a picture of his office with the bomb of damage. There's actually another picture, which I've got taken side on, uh, which shows it in more detail. And interestingly, uh, in the captions for it, it says, Hurley uh, Diary. And I think the photograph was obviously done by Frank Hurley, and somewhere in his diary will be what's there. I've got to go down and cap to camera and look at his diaries. They've been on exhibition recently and see what he wrote about seeing that, because he obviously took the photograph either on the day that it was bombed or very shortly thereafter. Oh, I've gone one too many. That shows you where Tobruk is in relation <coughs> to uh, the North African coast. When my father took over, uh, took charge, the army was advancing and they got as far as uh, Benghazi captured hundreds of thousands of Italians, who uh, many of them subsequently appeared uh, here in, in prisoner of war camps. Uh, but Rommel arrived in uh, North Africa and started pushing the, the British back. And they push, pushed them right back to not quite as far as Mercer true on that map. But the one thing they did manage to do was to take Tobruk. That's a chart of Tobruk Harbour. It's, it is the best harbour on that coast, quite well protected. And of course it could be, it could, they could be patrolled well for uh, anti-submarine. So they had a lot of uh, uh, a lot of ships going in and out of there. Some of them, unfortunately, didn't go out. Uh, and that's some of, some of what the harbour looked like. There's another one. And another one. Uh, they did make use of them every now and then. That's a picture of the, of the gunboat Ladybird. And it, it, had, it, it had sunk that far, and there was still a room around the gun, and the army manned the gun and actually shot down a few of German aircraft from, from there, so quite interesting. Um, but of course, it made life very difficult for unloading, because all the jetties and things had these sunken ships, so when they got a ship in with a whole lot of stuff. They had to unload it, 
uh, across them. One of the other things was, of course, the was too sensitive. Um, was the uh, way people got in and out. Uh, it's worth diverting at this stage to say uh, people don't realise quite how much was moved in and out by the ships. So something over 30,000 people were taken out of Tobruk, 30,000 people were taken into Tobruk to replace them. There were a whole lot of prisoners taken out, about 7,000. Wounded were taken out. Stores, oh, every, every single piece of uh, food and ammunition and stores of petrol, everything was taken in and out by, by ship. I think there were also 18 sheep taken in. <laughs> they were taken in because the Indians wanted sheep to eat. So they were together, they were looked after. Well, that might have been for the Arabs. No, no, no. <laughs> it was for the Indians. The, uh, the interesting thing is that there were, there were actually, there were the British Royal Navy, there was the Australian Navy, there were Canadian Navy people there, there were South African Navy people there. Uh, I think there was one Indian ship but there were a lot of, uh, a lot of different uh, Commonwealth navies involved. And the, the thing on the screen there is a rather amusing thing. I found it actually in uh, uh, General Monash's uh, archives. General Monash was the, uh, the general commanding the Australian troops. It's actually a schedule when it says up the top, uh, the following ships will sail as indicated. For Matru, Saturday the 21st of June, HMAS Stewart uh, from the Harbour Anchorage and HMAS Voyager from uh, Oiling Jetty. Intending passengers by above ve vessels should assemble at Tobruk Steamship Company offices, the Empty House, that's his office, not later than whatever it is, for final instructions and internal inoculation. I think that means a drink. <laughs> May Westerns will be supplied on board, all precautions uh, taken, but personal safety not guaranteed. In the event of a shipmaster hazarding, stranding, or inadvertently losing his vessel, well, it's just too bad. <laughs> Sailings from a true or for Tobruk, these are dependent entirely upon the whim of C and C and or uh, Rear Admiral uh, Alexander. And then it lists HMS Stewart, and beside that you see B and A, I think it is, uh, and HMS Voyager, and so on. A will berth at Oiling Jet, or Waterhen and Vendetta. And I think the interesting things are the ones down the right, right hand side. Uh, e, F, X, and Y. And X was the senior ship with plenty of booze. Y is a charming <coughs> cap captain with a long ship. If you know what a long ship is, it uh, means that there's quite an interval between drinks. Uh, good Eats for the next one, private bathroom, best cabin, ample booze, and F was lashing of booze. And then it lists the captain. Stuart was uh, Heck Waller, Captain H.M. Waller, Voyager, uh, Commander J.C. Morrow, Cotton Morrow, Waterhen, Lieutenant Commander J. Swain, and Vendetta, Lieutenant Commander Rusty Rhodes. Um, in fact, my father took, you know, took passage in all those ships from, uh, on at least one, if not more, occasion. And then the bottom thing says that purchase a return ticket available for three months and interchangeable with Saranaika Airways Incorporated when operating. I think that was a, a, a thing for the RAF. It, it didn't operate very much. 
you can save yourself 20 mils, which was a tiny amount of money in Egyptian currency. Mm. This is a picture of the water hen. Yes. One of the, the scrap iron flotilla, which is what they were known as, they were all World War I destroyers. And they've been kept on and uh, given to the Australian Navy. I think they were called the scrap arm to tell them because that's what Lord Hawhorn described them as. You know, mm -hmm. it's obviously totally incapable of doing anything. But they did a terrific job. Vendetta, I've, I can't remember, I did work out how many trips they all did, but it was well over 100. Vendetta did 37 trips alone during the period that they were there. And that's, that's a picture of Vendetta towing a hospital ship into Tobruk. Unfortunately, she got uh, she got uh, hit and she sank. I think actually that's probably uh, Lieutenant Commander Swain standing on her bridge, ordering an abandoned ship. The other Australian ship that got um, got sunk was the Parramatta. Uh, and they have a ceremony every every year up in Parramatta uh, to commemorate her loss. I don't know whether any of you have seen any of those videos the naval history people do. Uh, they did the one with the Brook Ferry service. If you are interested, I've got the link here, which will tell you about it. Yes, Stuart, Vampire, Vendetta, Voyager, Waterhand, Parramatta, Nizam, Napier, and Yarra were all Australian ships which are mentioned in my father's uh, notebooks. I'm just That's the Hurley photograph, so you can see that uh, did a good job on getting rid of the bodies. My, fa my father recorded that uh, uh, he had left his jacket on a chair up in his office and the only thing that was uh, left of his jacket were the sleeves with the four gold rings on on the ends of the sleeves. Unfortunately, I discovered this much later on, about, 1989, about 1990. After the war, somebody, uh, an Admiral Nace, uh, Dunbar Naismith, uh, wrote to my father and said, we're setting up a, a, an exhibition of interesting things. Have you got anything of interest? And my father said, oh yes, I've got these sleeves which I've got. <laughs> uh, and Dunbar's days were still all oh, fabulous. So um, and, um, I'd like to have those. So my father sent them off. And he also sent it off a, a little cardboard uh, thing with writing on it. What it was, uh, my father, before going out to Egypt, had been in, in command of a ship called the Black Swan up in Norway in the fjords. And of course, when Germany invaded uh, there, uh, they had great problems with radio because being down in the fjord, you couldn't get radio reception. So they obviously sent an aeroplane over to where he was in the Black Swan uh, to give him a message. That, the aeroplane tried to do it with an all list flying round and round. That was hopeless. So eventually they, uh, they put a writing on this card and dropped it in a tin into the ship skimmer, which was sort of uh, going round the fjord. And my father said to Naismith, I've got this too. Well, Naismith took both of them. 
he returned the card uh, saying that uh, the Directorate of Naval Intelligence said this should be destroyed because it's got a code signal on it. My father said it would be destroyed over my dead body and my brother actually still has it. And he was in, he was a naval aviator and he said this is exactly the same as the things we used when we ha wanted to drop a message to people. But unfortunately, we didn't have the gold, the sleeves. So I wrote to the first sea lord and said, here's the correspondence, could I please have the sleeves? Sadly, nobody knows where they are. Richard. After the siege was over, um, Cunningham sent out a signal. And I think it's worth it. I will just read this if I may. During the siege of Tobruk between the 12th of April and the 10th of December, the following were moved by sea. Personnel in 32,667. Personnel out. 34,113, wounded out, 7,516, prisoners of war out, 7,097, stores in, 33,946 tons, tanks in, 72, guns in, 98, 92, sheep, sheep in, 108. Following casualties were sustained. Destroyers 2, sloops 3, anti submarine and man minesweeping vessels 6, 7, A lighters, they were attack landing craft uh, thing, 6, HM store carriers uh, and schooners 7, gunboats 1, fast mine layers 1. Fast mine layer, mine layer was the Altona. And she was scheduled to pick up the last of the Australians who were left. They relieved the Australians with Polish troops in about September. And there was one lot left there. And the Lantona was going in to pick them up, but she got uh, sunk. So those Australians stayed for the whole of the siege, whereas the others could. Ships damaged, destroyers seven, sloops one. Anti-submarine and minesweepers ships 11, a lighters 3, gunboats 3, uh, schooner 1, and HMS Glenroy, which was a liner uh, as well. Mm -hmm. Merchant ships sunk, 6 and 1 schooner. Merchant ships damaged, 6. Naval, naval casualties, killed or missing, 459, wounded, 186. Merchant service, killed or missing, 70, wounded, 55. So it just shows what a, a, a major operation. Uh, interestingly too, um, I think the Naval War Memorial said that it was uh, uh, one of, the, it's probably the longest siege in the whole of British military history, which is very, uh, puts it in its place. The other thing that's interesting is after I published the book, I happened to, uh, speak to Governor General, uh, Sir Peter Cosgrove, and he said to me, he said, if the, Na if the Navy hadn't known that the, uh, sorry, if the Army hadn't known that the Navy would supply them and keep them going, that siege would never have lasted. The Army would have said, right, we're off. Uh, and of course, it was the same thing that happened when Rommel was pushed back, Tobruk was relieved, and then Rommel came back again, and they decided that they couldn't afford the same sort of operation to support Tobruk, and Tobruk was basically lasted about three or four days, and then surrendered. Fortunately, my father wasn't in Tobruk, stage. He'd been relieved in command in March and he went on to uh, take command of H sorry, HMS Jarvis at 
J-class destroyer. And he was uh, what's known as Captain Destroyer Flotilla 40, which was uh, a collection of J and K and L-class destroyers. He took up his command after, I think, he, I think he had about a week's break from Tobruk. He took up his command, and two days later, he was sailing uh, under uh, Rear Admiral Byron in a uh, force which was to escort a Malta convoy. And you probably know Malta was besieged all the, all the time in the Mediterranean and was used as a submarine base to attack all the convoys that were taking stuff across the Mediterranean to Rome. But they got bombarded, it was a hell of a place to be. And of course, they had uh, terrible problems resupplying all the time. Uh, they had convoys go through, or trying to get through, and in a couple of cases, none, no ships got through. And uh, on other cases, it was very few of them. So, Dad was off with his destroyer squadron. There was another destroyer squadron, and I think Barn had four or five um, cruisers. The weather was pretty appalling, uh, but they, um, and that's one of, I think that's Uralis, one of the cruisers. And their guns were 5.25 inch guns. Anyway, they set off. They were attacked originally by aircraft, and that's a picture of uh, them firing at an aircraft. I don't know that I can actually make it out. I think it's just underneath the, mm -hmm. the right-hand side of the uh, smoke there. <coughs> uh, charging through. But of course, what they didn't realize until it became uh, evident, they were up against a fairly hefty Italian squadron. What? one battleship, I think the Littorio, and also two heavy cruisers, all of which had eight-inch guns, and a few destroyers, but dis their destroyers didn't. Uh, when, they, when they picked up this uh, Italian force, they told the convoy to go to the south, and they went up and made, made smoke, those previous uh, pictures show them making smoke. That, that was stopping uh, the um, Italians seeing where the convoy was. Uh, they were ordered, the destroyers were ordered to attack by bar, and my father took his uh, five ships to within three miles of the Littoria before turning and firing torpedoes. That's one of the torpedoes being fired. Anyway, that, that uh, persuaded the Italians to turn around and go home, which uh, was fortunate. Sadly, the, uh, uh, the convoy, the ships, had taken some <coughs> time avo avoiding the, um, the Italian ships, but they didn't get to Malta until after daylight the next day. And of course, the German Luftwaffe uh, bombed all of them. They got one of them into <coughs> into uh, into the letter harbour and were able to unload some of it. They got another one into what's called Marge Schlock, which is a harbour on the coast of uh, uh, Malta, not a not a proper port, and it got in there. Mm -hmm. and the third ship that they were escorting was sunk. That's the uh, that's the tor torpedo firing key from HMS Jarvis, and it's uh, marked uh, Medina uh, Bank, which was where the action took place. And the medal in in it is the companion of the bard medal that he got as a result. This one in. 
that's another example of the, uh, uh, the letters. But the left-hand page there, I think it says uh, Wednesday the 1st of April, and I don't think it was an April Fool's joke what he was writing here. It says, moved AM to Boy for director test. Walked around Jackal, which was one of the ships used to visit the uh, uh, ships. A party of Egyptian military on board. Make and mend till 15... 40 or something, and then moved to H boy for telephone, etc. Very hot. And then he wrote something which I have never seen in any book about the war at all. Doing income tax. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you have to do your income tax. <laughs> no, nobody, nobody bothered to write about it in their war experiences. Was that COVID or something? It says passport and so on. However, he did, he did have some other excitements. A little bit later on, I think in May, he took four destroyers out from uh, from Alexandria. Uh, a, a convoy had been detected uh, coming down from Italy to resupply Rome, and they sent him out with these four ships. His instructions were that if they were if they saw an aircraft, a German aircraft, they were to turn round because they uh, had acknowledged by them that. If they couldn't provide air cover for ships, then Germany had occupied Crete. And if you remember that map between Crete and North Africa, it's pretty narrow. So the Germans had uh, amazing air cover there. And of course, the R RAF didn't have a lot of aircraft. Anyway, they went out. And these are two ships of the four. Uh, I think they'd been out for about a day and a half. They'd seen one German aircraft, but it seemed to be way off in, in the distance, so they didn't take any of this. Then another one uh, got a bit closer, and so they said, OK, we'll go back. But they were attacked. The only ship, uh, uh, the only ship of the three, uh, there was Jarvis, Kipling, uh, Jackal, and lively. The only, the only ship that had any uh, guns which would go up sufficient elevation to be called anti-aircraft guns was lively. She had four inch guns. All the others were 4.7 and they, you know, they were mainly for surface action. Whether the Germans knew or not, but the first ship they sunk was the lively. And shortly after, and I think this shows the Kipling, circling the Jackal survivors, they, they bombed the Kip, Kipling. So that was no good. Um, and, and I think the Jackal got hit. And by this, oh, and that's right, there are a lot of survivors in the water. And my father said to them, look, keep afloat. I'm going off because there's no point in me staying here because I should get thing. Anyway, he came back after dark and he went back to Alexandria and he had 622 survivors of the other three ships on board. They only lost 70 men altogether. And my father put it down to the fact that there was very good discipline. That they did what they were, the sailors did what they were told and they survived. That's a, a typical picture of my father with his pipe. I don't know who the lieutenant commander is, but I suspect he was the squadron navigator. Towards the end of that year, about November, uh, they decided to station a whole lot of ships in Malta as Force J. 
and to to make attacking Rommel's convoys easier. And that's a picture of the captains of uh, Force J. My father's the third one on the uh, left, being inquisitive, seeing what's going on. Uh, that's Lord Gaunt, who was the uh, governor of Malta, being introduced to these captains by uh, Rear Admiral Power, who had taken over from Dyer. Uh, the tall man just to the right of uh, uh, Power is, uh, oh dear, my name's gone. Uh, I have the privilege of being a lieutenant in Eagle under his captaincy. Some of you may, if you're naval people, you might know the man on the right. Who's the fellow on the right? Anybody know? I do. I think you do? Yes. John Allison. John Allison, yes. <laughs> he, was, he was the captain of one of my father's ships. He uh, retired from the Royal Navy and came out here and uh, went and lived with his family on Three Hummock Island in Bass Strait. <laughs> And uh, uh, it was a well-known place to go and visit by RM ships. Sadly, I was in Warramunga, and we went to Three Hammock Island, and I didn't know he'd been my father. But I met him. He joined Shropshire in uh, late 43. Spent two years in uh, Shropshire. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was after he'd been in Shropshire. Yes. Anyway, eventually, up in January 1943, my father was uh, uh, was relieved of the command of the thing to go, go home. His, his successor was a fellow called uh, Pugsy, who uh, had been one of his uh, destroyer commanders. And he was very pleased with that. Pugsy has written a very interesting book. My father had quite an interesting time. He flew from Malta to uh, Algiers, Algiers to Iran, Iran to Gibraltar, and Gibraltar to Petri, Petri to Hen. Uh, there was no sort of guarantee that you could have a seat. <laughs> you just sort of turned up and said, I want to go. I want to go to uh, England, please. Anyway, eventually got there. And he went home, and that's where we were, living, slightly modified since then. We'd lived there for most of the war. And he was re reunited with his family. Uh, but one of the entries, uh, one of the e entries in the book uh, at the end there mm -hmm. says, uh, took Peter to Barnstable to the dentist to have his teeth out. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's another one, took him to Exeter, took him to Exeter to see Aladdin, good show, he said. Mm -hmm. And then another one, I think he took me to Exeter, put me on a train to Cheltenham where I was at school. He was having problems trying to get, uh, trying to get uniforms and things. And that's, that's his medals. Mm -hmm. I'm very proud of those that I have. I'm reading from left to right, there's a KBE, a CB, a DSO, and a bar, and a DSC. He got a DSC in World War I for torpedoing the bow at Zabruga. And then we've got three World War I campaigns. Uh, five World War II and a Greek medal, the one with the cross swords. There's also a which was his Tabuk medal, Rats Tabuk medal, which I'm very proud of having. In 1961, the Rats Tabuk had a pilgrimage to Tabuk and on to England. They went down to Cornwall, where my father was living, and they presented him with that, which says, 
Australian Pilgrimage 1961, presented to Vice Admiral Sir Albert And I've got that too. Finished off as a Vice Admiral, there he is. I was uh, feeling a bit guilty that I'd only, uh, I'd only covered two years of a 46 year career. I've got a lot of other material. Uh, and I thought maybe I ought to do something about it. But a month after going down and doing the video with the, the Navy on the Tobruk Ferry, uh, Vice Admiral Peter Jones, who was sort of in charge of it, uh, about a month after, got in touch with me. He said, I've been reading a bit about your father. I think he's an interesting man. I'd like to write his biography. So I thought, oh, yes, please talked to my brother and he said yes you have access to all the material. I would said to my sister so the sister-in-law I said I've written this book here I feel I ought to cover the rest of my father's career she said no 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 you've got to write your own first <laughs> now I've got no excuse <coughs> thank you very much mm -hmm. We had to start a quick operation. He moved to Mirza Matru and worked from there. But he used to go, uh, I think about four, about four or five times, he went to Cairo to talk to Cunningham and the staff down there. And on each occasion, he, he either went all the way to Alexandria in a ship, or he went to Mirza Matru and then uh, flew on. And sometimes flew away. I think they um, before the after the siege was over. I think he did fly into what was uh, known as El Adam, which was the air, air base for Tobruk. But he, his his base was in Tobruk. Every when he moved to Mersmatru, he had all the problems of getting communications and everything. You know, so. You had to scrounge and go to whatever you could. He managed to get a car. Mm. Any more? It might seem a rather technical question, but um, was there a transition point when they went under his command, that the, mm. the vessels went under his command? Obviously, he didn't command the vessels directly, <coughs> but it would have had to be a time when he did. Well, they were at his direction. His direction, they would have been under command of someone else. Under command. And, and uh, under command normally they then get handed yeah. over another yeah, under yeah. his operational control yeah. to send them so he can send them elsewhere. There was a rare, rare admiral destroyers in. Yeah. Uh,